Oh, you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Can you all hear me? Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Amara Maksud. I'm an associate professor in social anthropology at UCL. And I will take a few minutes to introduce this event and our impetus for holding it. Um, this event is part of a series, an initiative of like-minded colleagues in the anthropology departments of UCL, LSC, and Goldsmiths to think about the aims and values of anthropological research in resisting oppression, in standing with our interlocutors, friends and colleagues, and what are our responsibilities. We were prompted here by one of our former students. On October 13, 2023, a recently graduated Gazan master's student of UCL anthropology wrote to a group of her former instructors, asking, and I quote, what is the Department of Anthropology doing? Is their response limited to condemning acts of genocide and colonization only when the colonized people have already died? The urgency cannot be overstated. It is happening now. I wish I was in Gaza too. I am not, and I understand this is a new st stage of our genocide, and there is so much work to be done from the outside. Silence is violence. The least to be done is that the Department of Anthropology must recognize the urgency and gravity of this and stand with Gaza. Her, her words moved us and pointed out our responsibility as educators and those who stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. One of the ways in which we respond to her is to turn this question onto ourselves. What is it that we are doing? While other events will bring in experts on and from Palestine, <coughs> This event brings together anthropologists who do not work on or are from the region. The aim here being to think about the violence in Palestine in relation to the discipline of anthropology, in anthropology at large rather than a regional problem, and to make it clear that it should not be the burden of Palestinian people alone to speak out at this time. As a discipline, anthropology has engaged very little with what is happening in Gaza. And this can be really viscerally felt when we look at who has been the most present, and active in organizing discussions. In our department at UCL, and I suspect this might be the case in other departments, events have been organized by students, by junior staff members on precarious contracts, people who work on Palestine or are from, uh, are from Palestine, are of Jewish backgrounds, and anthropologists who are people of color. Just like Gaza is humanity's other, Talking about Gaza, it has felt, is like the problem of the others of established academic hierarchies. But why is anthropology so silent? Anthropology talks about violence all the time. We document physical, symbolic, and structural violence with intricate detail. We talk about when violence, violence ruptures everything, even language, and yet it recedes into the ordinary and comes out in, in everyday life. We talk about ethno-nationalism and the nation state. We interrogate the lethal and bloody logic of the anthropological machine, which functions on the perpetual differentiation between of the human and its other. Anthropology places witnessing its capacity of knowledge of the other, but also the, it, it's, its capacity to give us the knowledge of the other, but also to transform the self as central to the discipline. It has even taken seriously the claims of people who, in the wake of intense change, talk of zombies who are going to come and steal their organs. Then how is it that today, right now, when we are witnessing almost live stream the killing of thousands of people in what most rights groups and international organizations are calling a genocide, when we are witnessing the discovery of mass graves near hospitals where patients are buried with their catheters still in, where we find zip-tied bodies with skin and organs missing, where there is evidence that some people were buried alive, why is it that right now anthropology has nothing to say? In this event, we want to interrogate the silence. What is it about anthropology's own history and the broader socio-political environment of higher education in the UK that makes us this silent? Is it fear? Is it indifference? And if we are to speak about this violence, what are the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have and confront? The speakers today reflect on this discomfort. What is it at stake? And what are the questions we need to ask and think of? They also speak of how to engage with the violence in relation to their own subject positions and histories. How e even if they live in, live in or work in areas far from the Middle East, how these issues seep into their own work and relationships. And how we can think about an anthropological <coughs> practice that tries to enduringly speak and con confront violence. I'm very grateful to our panel, to Ludo, Sultan, Julia, and Andrea, 
for speaking today, for choosing to think through their discomforts with an audience, to address questions that they might not have absolute answers for. And I will be honest, it was not easy to find academics willing to do that. I got several no's and, in fact, silences, invitations that were never responded to in trying to form this panel. And so I want to acknowledge their courage and generosity and to make the audience mindful of this, mindful of this and to ask them to ask questions that are in the spirit of a dialogue rather than an accusation. Mayanka and I will take our jobs very seriously in how we moderate and chair this event, and we will cut off comments that are not in the spirit of a dialogue. I will now ask our chair, Mayanka Mukherjee, to step in. Mayanka was kind enough to step in on short notice when our original chair, Mona Dujani, was unable to come. So Mayanka will take it on from here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Mayanka. I'll, I'm the chair for this event. Um, I'm just going to very quickly um, introduce or just say the names of the speakers and the order in which they will speak. So we have uh, Ludovic Kupai from UCL, um, Sultan Dugan from Goldsmiths, Julia Sauma from Goldsmiths as well, and Andrea Peer from LSE. Um, and thank you to our moderator, Amara Maksud um, from UCL. And the format for this discussion is going to be, it's going to start off as a panel um, speaking. Each person will have about 15 minutes to speak. Um, and then we'll go into more of an interactive kind of question answer format, which uh, both Amara and I will be moderating. So yeah, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to invite uh, Ludovic, our first speaker to come and speak. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's do this. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, the organizer of this. As uh, Amara has mentioned, it has not been very easy to find people. And for some reason, the fact that I'm one of the oldest member of UCL participant makes me feel uncomfortable. Uh, but I think uh, I'm going to start with a question that was asked back in 1968 in France during the student revolt when a public speaker was speaking in the Sorbonne. Incidentally, May 68 was started uh, uh, when there were rumors of the police on campus. Just like, just saying, right? <laughs> so what am I am speaking for? So I'm French. I'm non-white. Um, I've got a complicated historical uh, family, like many other people, but I have to say that somehow it happens that I've got family tie with um, Algeria and uh, through my stepfather, who is uh, half Ashkenazi and half Sephardi, with a complicated history going back to 1911 and including current Ukraine and pogroms and etc. And that's the person who raised me and who gave me the tools to think. And I think it's quite interesting because for, from what I've learned from him is for him, Algerian, Arab, and, and Jewish were the same. That's an important point. So I, I speak from that. I speak also from a position of a family activism, which I've not necessarily endorsed for different sort of reasons. Uh, but this is from that position that I want to talk about, and definitely not a specialist of the area, not even of political anthropology. I'm a material culture specialist, but I would argue that I deal with form of domination in other ways. So today I wanted to talk about discomfort. And like others, I feel a huge discomfort being here, speaking about what's going on over there. It's not about what I, discomfort about what I think or what I feel, but more about speaking here in public and publicly, because this is also a very important moment when we need to speak about something that I'm not supposed to be an expert of. And also speaking about, in an analytical way or whatever you want to say about events, actual events which are actually today killing people. But despite this discomfort, I agreed to come here and to speak because indeed I believe that silence is the worst of answer always, everywhere, about everything. It always leaves room for the worst possible answer because it is often close to indifference. 
And this is far from what we feel, I think. Even my colleagues will refuse to speak. <coughs> Discomfort is useful to examine, I say. I think it tells me something about what is happening here today in Gaza. I think it's about the reason why many of my colleagues didn't want to speak or didn't feel to speak or why I feel I fear to speak about that is the ideological aberrant trap of falling into the side of either anti-Semitism or <coughs> and I think that's a very important. And um, so we have to, fall, to, fall, to avoid falling into that trap. It's not about a bin binary here. I think also a lot of people feel discomfort, and I feel discomfort, to um, avoid the but effect. And that's something that I owe to my partner who is working on gender violence and sex crimes and reminded me that, you know, in the famous sentence, she was raped, but she shouldn't have worn a dress like that. You know the but. And when you say the but here, you often um, somehow justify the first part of the but. The reason why I'm talking about the but here is because, of course, I cannot not talk about the 7th of October, and I think we shouldn't. Right. So it's very easy when we talk about rape to say that the but, you know, to deal with the but, because obviously the first part is morally and ethically unacceptable. Here, we can't. Both the 7th of October and the ethnic cleansing, ethnic cleansing that we are seeing and the genocide that we are seeing, both of them are morally, ethically unacceptable. So that makes the two events very hard to think together, I think. The 7th of October was indeed a horrible, atrocious event, but the response by the Netanyahu government, and insist about the Netanyahu government, is also abhorrent. So we can't and we shouldn't use but, whatever we put before or after the but. But both those events extract my compassion, and the problem it also extracts my horror. Because, first of all, it's very difficult to think because both are part of a longer historical sequence which involves, among other things, last century colonial past that involved France, the UK, and nowadays the US. But also because it involves somehow the still horrifying specter of the Holocaust and its consequences. So I can't afford being indifferent or silent, even though it's very difficult for me to think and to speak about those events. Because it's not neither about neutrality, it is about <clears> the <throat> sadness that I, me, Ludo, as an anthropologist, right, feel in what I see unfolding and the future and what it means for the future of the lives of the people who are involved. It also makes me feel like very sad and uncomfortable about my little ability to do anything here but ask questions. So Yes, let's try. Let's try to ask questions and what, try to think about what these events tell us from an anthropological perspective and try to still keep with that compassion and, and sort of uh, thoughtfulness about what it means to think about horror from an analytical perspective. So what it tells me is about the age-old modality of relation between domination and resistance, right? about nation-state legitimization of violence, be ethnic cleansing or terrorism. And I ask the question about, is there an alternative to those two forms of violence? Is there other way to resist domination, right? Is it the only response is violence? The fact that we might not have an answer <coughs> is in itself discomforting, I think. But it still not, shouldn't stop us from thinking through it, even anthropologically and perhaps especially anthropologically. So what I'm trying to say here is the fact whatever my lack of knowledge or my lack of legitimacy to talk meaningfully about that, about those events, I think we still have to talk about it. So, thank you.
They still can't hear us. It's a problem with the central system. So he's trying to fix that. We try to help them hear us through the laptop. <coughs> if that doesn't help, you might have to reboot your whole system, which will take about five minutes. I think. <coughs> if you're okay with that. Right yeah, now? fine. No, we, we, we try the laptop first. You, you guys go ahead. Okay. If that doesn't work, we'll Okay. Maybe I'm after gonna, some time. I'm not going to speak. Yeah. All right. Uh, there seem to be some technical technical issues, but um, I hope everyone can hear me. I will speak as much, as loud as I can, and I also hope it's, it's a very strange setup, I have to say. I saw pictures of this room, and I actually thought that we are sitting in the back, and then later I understood that we're sitting in the front, which was for me not the ideal uh, seating position. But then I saw the Zoom screen, and I was like, oh, hell. <laughs> They're going to see me from my, like, back head, and I arranged my face to be seen from the front. <laughs> Now you don't even see me. <laughs> okay, and something is happening here. So, first of all, thanks for having me here tonight. I would like to thank uh, especially Amara for organizing this, Mayanka for chairing this event. There were also other people involved in the background, including Ricardo and Brandman. I thank the students and the audience for wanting to listen to, to me and my colleagues in this intense and critical time. Same as my fellow panelist, Julia Sauma. I'm being threatened with having the Department of Anthropology at Goldsmiths made redundant by 30%. As a redundancy plan at Goldsmiths is part of a larger effort to shut down and make the humanities and social sciences and higher education even more precarious and less relevant, I appreciate that colleagues at LSE and UCL, together with their students, demonstrate the opposite, namely the relevance and important role anthropology can play in the world. And yet, I am aware that anthropology is a rather silent and prudent discipline. But perhaps, not the silence, but the prudence, perhaps this can help us think through some delicate nodal points together. This is really an invitation. I have I've been working on this for 20 years, and yet, as I speak to you now, I am afraid as hell, okay? I want to be very honest about this. But I'm also aware that UCL students staged and restaged an occupation in solidarity with Gaza, similar, similar to Goldsmith students who occupied the Stuart Hall building for more than a month and demanded better policies from the university including a divestment from companies that were profiting from the occupation in Palestine and the ongoing genocidal war in Gaza specifically. To the students who have disrupted the business as usual in order to bring awareness to the heightened levels of destruction and annihilation in Gaza, I want to express my heartfelt solidarity. Thank you for reminding us that this is your space of learning and that you want to learn in ways <coughs> that live up to the promise of higher education, which is to enable you to think through and beyond the political and social confines in order to imagine and live a more just world. Thank you for your refusal to be complicit in a genocidal war. So as I speak to you tonight, I speak as an anthropologist of Europe, of violence and memory, of race and secularism, of citizenship and migration. And as Amara said, although I have studied in the Middle East, about the Middle East, I did my PhD actually on Germany. And I have a very different understanding what these regional um, sectionings do to our discipline. Okay? I think in a way it's good for us as anthropologists to be regionally specific, to understand cultural particularity, But I also have understood that through my work in Berlin specifically, that the Middle East is not a place out there simply, okay? That we're connected in very complex and uh, intimate ways. So when I did my work with civic educators, social workers, museum guides, and community organizers, mostly of Middle Eastern descent, and most of them were actually either of Turkish descent or of Palestinian descent, and I'm happy to say more about this in the Q&A, why these two, but most of you might actually know that Berlin is home to the largest uh, Turkish and Palestinian diasporas. 
whose places, you know, they came in in different times with very different aims, but they've shifted from various legal, political, and racial configurations to the singular figure of the Muslim. And the singular figure of the Muslim, um, interestingly, I mean, perhaps some of you have lived through September 11 and what happened afterwards with the war on terror. This happened in Germany at a time in which citizenship was actually reformed. There was a promise for more equality for uh, immigrant-born children or children of immigrant descent. But at the same time, what came through was a very deeply seated racial thinking of who can be German. Of course, this did not in include Jews back then or kind of being Jewish. It really included a Christian secularized notion of being German. And it also came with a thrust of securitization. And the securitization, interestingly enough, although aimed at securitizing Islamic extremism, uh, and interestingly, you know, what could be considered Islamically extremist, uh, really dependent on context. It could include wanting to wear hijab in public office, um, but also saying that there's a place called Palestine. Okay? <laughs> so the war on terror, which I think is being in a way renewed, discursively renewed at this very moment as I'm speaking, where many people think that making certain decisions in the parliament or letting certain people protest mm -hmm. on the streets, or actually, not just in the UK or in Germany, letting students in camp in order to protest the war that has taken on genocidal dimensions is being argued, is being counter-argued as combating Islamic extremism, as combating Hamas, as combating terror, okay? So, while there, is a, there was a version of this already 20 years ago, and it has grown, it has grown in ways, I think, that kind of shows itself very specifically when it comes to Palestine. When I went to do field work, okay, I was um, much younger, and I was a bit more hopeful, and um, I did not think of Palestine. As I said, I was doing field work in Berlin, Germany, and I had very simple questions. I mean, in hindsight, they're actually simple questions. They're good questions because they're crystallizing questions. But often I felt so discouraged because they felt so brutally naive uh, given what I actually experienced, okay? And I want to tell you first about my questions and then I will tell you what I experienced. So my main question was, what can citizenship be as a legal and political promise after genocide, specifically after the Holocaust of European Jewry, Roma, and Sinti? How are basic human rights distributed? How are they practiced? Where are they learned and rehearsed? How do citizens produce politics? Politics is not simply there. Everyone who has protested in the last months, you have gotten a sense how you exercise your rights. It's not simply you have rights. You get to navigate your rights, right? So, but also, how do we then create equality? What kind of memories, stories, and ideals guide such actions and practices? Where is the place of other racisms, atrocities, massacres, and yes, even genocides in this promise of citizenship? And I should say, I arrived in Germany in October 2014 to conduct this field work, which was a couple of months after what we back then called the Gaza War. Okay? So that was a war that lasted 50 days. And so according to UNRWA, 2,251 Palestinians killed, the majority of them civilians, uh, and 551 of them children, okay? And I was convinced, going into my field site, thinking back then, again, I was very young and naive, that this was a terrible war that was unprecedented, that we had seen, you know, um, infrastructural devastation in Gaza that should have, would have political and social consequences in a place like Germany that prides itself on human rights, that prides itself in the rule of law, right? That prides itself having overcome genocide and having faced dark pasts. So I had expectations, and instead, what I found out was that whenever I entered field work, the whole discourse was spun around anti-Semitism. And I do want to be very careful with anti-Semitism because I do think discriminating against the religious community, against the minoritized community, against the racialized community is, is absolutely horrible, especially with the history that Germany and Europe carries. But the notion of anti-Semitism was not one in which it was simply about 
a community, but it could be detected by saying, um, you know, my grandparents were kicked out of Palestine in 1948. That could be considered an anti-Semitic sentence. Okay, why? And then there was a whole apparatus, a whole epistemological apparatus, why this is anti-Semitic, that Arabs did just run away, okay, and they, they had a chance to live there peacefully, and to begin with, and this was always kind of like jarring, sitting there with people of Palestinian background, telling these people that actually Palestinians don't exist. They're just Arabs. There were some grand, you know, feudal lords um, who actually sat in Cairo and Damascus and Beirut, and they had these falahin coming to kind of be peasants, seasonal work, and then leave, okay? But now there was a kind of a, Time bomb, and that was really interesting to also hear these words, right? Like, like, you are considering refugees in Lebanon a time bomb because they want to go back, they want to claim return to their homeland. So, but as you all know, when you're an anthropologist, you don't want to, you don't want to offend. You want to learn. You go with the benefit of doubt. You want to like, why do you say time bomb? Uh, why do you use that word, right? And you're also dependent. You're dependent on these people working with you, giving you access, letting you <coughs> sit there, right? But you sit there and you're like, hey, this is unlike anything I have learned in my history books. So you look through the material that they use, what they use, and you realize that many of the material is actually produced in Israel. And it follows a both sides logic to some extent, but then again just follows a one side logic, the Israeli side of logic, okay? So, Another thing here was the status of victimhood, okay? We often think in terms of victimhood and perpetrator, okay? And there are some brilliant books written about this, right? Some people feel guilty, they're perpetrators. I could see in a society like Germany, yes, there is a sense of perpetratorship. There's a sense of agency. Yes, we have done this. Yes, we have paid for this. But I don't really feel guilty, right? So the sense of guilt is actually not there. It's a sense of embarrassment. It's not maybe something we shouldn't have done because retroactively Jews were whitened and they have a nation state of their own. They're, they have become respectable people. But what this all showed was that Palestinians could not claim injury. Palestinians could not claim suffering, okay? And this was really interesting. Why was Palestinian suffering so threatening to the liberal democratic order in Germany? So again, coming from a very naive position of like, okay, we have, um, we have all these rules of law, we have this way of like acting and participating, and yet there is a, and back then it was not police violence, it was not like what happened with Yanis Varoufakis, with the Palestine Congress, or with all the protesters in the last months, it was really an epistemological argumentation, a game, okay? So, This brings me really to the central question of this event. How does one reflect what is happening in Gaza when Gaza is a reflection of our times? So this is not simply happening in Gaza. There's a term for this. It's called progressives except for Palestine, right? So what does that mean? So you can actually say, I don't want to you know, buy products that are based on animal cruelty. I respect human rights, animal rights, children's rights, women's <laughs> rights. Um, I don't want to eat uh, GMO, genetically modified uh, products, produce, right? I want them to be organic. You make a citizen consumer point of a decision there. But when you say, actually don't want to be complicit in a genocidal war, I want my university where I'm actually learning, mm -hmm. where my instructors supposedly give me a decolonized syllabus mm -hmm. and where I'm supposedly I'm supposed to go out in the world and make a difference for social justice, mm -hmm. this is the first step I make and I get majorly punished, okay? Then I think Gaza is not out there, Gaza is here, in the sense that you get to see the limits of your own liberal democracy, of your own freedom. Mm -hmm. Gazans know that they live under siege and that they're being attacked. Palestinians know this for the last 75 years. You get to discover this now. We get to discover this now, okay? So what do we do with this as anthropologists? That's a big question I want to have in conversation with you, okay? I want to like not give you an answer to that. I want to invite you 
uh, after all these provocations, I hope, uh, to a more reflexive conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank Amara, Brannon, and Ricardo for the unexpected invitation um, and for the persistence and care necessary to create this space. It never crossed my mind that I might be someone that people would want to invite to speak to an event um, on anthropology in Gaza. Um, I had been kind of looking for an event like this, but I thought that I was going to be part of the audience asking questions. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my research is about violence, but it is about violence in Brazilian cities and the Brazilian Amazon and in academic spaces, focusing particularly on race, gender and disability. So I'm also grateful for you all pushing me to think about Gaza in relation to my work. And so I will begin the kind of reflexive process, I think, after the initial provocations here and kind of inviting you to think about <coughs> how we can reflect on this together as well. Um, since receiving Amara's email um, invitation, I thought a lot about also the importance of creating and sustaining spaces for reflection about violence in which the onus of the work is not laid on the shoulders of the people most affected by that violence, as Amara spoke in her open, opening comments. And this is something I am also very grateful for, particularly as I think about how important it is for me to see others take on anti-racist and anti-ableist work at Goldsmiths and how exhausting it is when it doesn't happen, and it frequently doesn't happen. Um, I'm going to read because, as you can see, because I think um, Sultan and I are going through a lot at the moment in Goldsmiths, and I could only really kind of process all of the thoughts I had on paper, so I hope you can bear with me. Um, so... While I thought about um, what I would raise here, many things crossed my mind. Um, and I kind of um, wrote to Amara some of those points um, in an email. At first, I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to change what I said I was going to talk about. <laughs> Not totally, but a little bit. So at first, I thought about my place in both the Lebanese and Jewish diaspora in Latin America and the place of that non-dominant diaspora, non-dominant as non-Euro-American, in a conversation about anthropology in Gaza, particularly the conservatism of both diaspora in Brazil. But as I was brought up at the edges of both of those communities in Brazil, because of my parents' intellectual and political convictions, I thought it would be more important for me to engage more directly with those edges, the edges that I come from, and also how my work relates to that experience. I was born in the middle of a violent military dictatorship in Brazil, the repercussions of which are still present in the country. I understand at a personal level the intergenerational trauma that is created by violence and by genocide in the aftermath of the Holocaust and forced migration in the face of military rule and in the ongoing indigenous genocide in the Brazilian Amazon. All of these events have left marks on my family on both sides in the form of a range of serious mental health issues, including schizophrenia, sociopathy, depression, despair, among others. It's not by accident, then, that both of my parents became psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and that I have thought about violence and trauma recurrently in my work. 
But while my parents delved into the traumas caused by this violence at an individual level, in my own work, I have delved into the collective repercussions of violence. For the last 18 years, I've worked with Quilombolas in the Brazilian Amazon, that is, black communities whose ancestors fought against enslavement and who continue to fight against anti-blackness today. And previously, I have worked with street children and young people in Rio de Janeiro who face brutal violence on their bodies on a daily basis. In both fields, my work has been led by the question that unexpectedly seems to be the most significant for my interlocutors in these very violent situations, which is how can togetherness, how can collectivity be sustained in the face of and against violence? Can it be sustained without violence? Why is that so difficult to sustain? In my work, I describe how collectivity, which is so crucial for creativity, pleasure, and vitality, and therefore, which is crucial for life to have meaning, how collectivity can disintegrate in the face of violence, how it can produce violence, and also how it is sustained or re-emerges in violent contexts in different complex and often unexpected forms. More recently, I have started also to reflect on how important it is for us to think about the cyclical nature of collectivity in the face of violence and the myriad ways in which people respond to that and how within its cyclical disintegration or weakening and re-emergence, people are constantly exploring, probing, and questioning the opposition between individual and collective experience. I thought that might be of interest here because exploring the relationship between individual and collective and the question of whether there is a limit to how parts and wholes can be connected or not is both a quintessential anthropological question because it is a human question and it is also very much about endurance and what endurance generates and what it costs. It is, for example, about what the endurance of communities who resist and or refuse violence and stay together means how it is sustained, what that resistance and or refusal generates and costs in terms of health, wealth, aspiration, joy, and internal violence, all of which are crucial in studies about indigenous and black collective resistance in North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and diasporic collectivity also more broadly. And exploring collective endurance is also about understanding the creation and defense of the nation state in the aftermath of colonialism and imperialism and the violence involved in the process of forcing <coughs> different communities together, a violence that functions at every level. It is physical, sensorial, emotional, symbolic, and structural and that requires us to keep our critical attention always on who carries and mobilizes supremacist power. Emphasizing power is crucial here, different forms of power. Um, and I think that we have to keep our eye on how moral arguments are mobilized in the service of supremacist power specifically. Mm -hmm. I also want to emphasize, however, that the relationship between the individual and the collective and my interest in power is not just something that is of interest in an abstract realm or just in relation to the state, not just in relation to supremacist power. I see it everywhere and in everyone, and particularly in people's preoccupations about their quality of life and their experiences of violence. In my current work, it is there in decisions around community organization and mobilization, for example, and who has the capacity or not to do different types of labor, uh, 
how people recognize people's different contributions towards the community, so that there are people who are able to talk about violence and confront supremacist power, so that those who cannot can also be recognized for other, other types of political and or power-focused work that they can do. And so that disappointments and frustrations in others can also be expressed and allowed to create distances that allow power to circulate and that can also be reduced later. So thinking about collectivity here today might be helpful, I think, in thinking about how anthropologists can enduringly engage with the violence in Gaza. I want to end quickly, because I think I'm probably running out of time. No? I have time. OK. But I'm going to end anyway. Uh, no, well, I want to end quickly by talking about my parents a little more, which is really strange for me, because They've driven me mad my entire life. Um, but I think it relates to what is happening in universities today um, in relation to the assault on the social science and humanities, on critical thought in the UK and in Europe, in the fear of talking about Gaza here, um, in the violence we're seeing in the US, um, and I want to talk about this again, as with um, Sultan, in solidarity with the students and their actions today. Um, and I think it speaks also to the question of securitization that Sultan was speaking about. My parents were both university students during the military dictatorship in Brazil. It's an experience that obviously they speak about regularly. One of their accounts, there are many, um, being, you know, having to hide from the military police in Brazil um, because they were being hunted down by, the, by them. Um, but one of their accounts really stood out for me when I was thinking about this event here today. And the experiences that we're having at Goldsmiths and the experiences that we're having in lots of different ways, um, which I think is useful here, to offer here. So one of the centers of student resistance um, during the military dictatorship in Rio de Janeiro was the Faculty of Medicine, strangely, for us today, in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where my parents studied. Um, this was located in one of the most iconic parts of Rio, right next to Sugarloaf Mountain, like literally right next to it. So it was in the center of the, well, near the center, but the south zone of Rio. It was the site of multiple occupations by students and violent clashes between students and military police, including what's become known as the um, 1966 massacre. Um, and in 1973, the faculty was um, moved to an island on the peripheries of Rio and in 1975, that old colonial, pink colonial building, right, massive colonial building, was demolished by the military government. I cannot state how big it is, how big of a deal it is for a military government to demolish a colonial building in Brazil. There is no doubt in my parents' mind and in the mind of historians in Brazil that demolishing that building was part of a crackdown on student protest and resistance. There is no doubt in my mind that the assault on the social sciences, arts and humanities in the UK and in Europe, the fear being generated about talking about Gaza is also part of a crackdown on political mobilization and critical thought that in Goldsmith's case is being done by the people who should be protecting us. Um, nowadays, in Brazil, medicine as a discipline, and I think in most countries, is the locus of some of the most right-wing narratives imaginable. They are the supporters, the preeminent supporters of Bolsonaro in Brazil. I hope that the same will not happen here to our disciplines, so that we're not looking back at four, in 40 years' time, talking about social, or like, you know, thinking about what the social sciences were at one point. Um, I also want to talk briefly, and this is not something I wrote about, in relation to this question that um, 
Amara raised about why is anthropology so silent in the UK? And I want to really kind of emphasize something that is clear to me. Anthropology, you, you said, why is anthropology so silent? To me, the, the question is, why is anthropology so silent here in the UK? Okay? Because in Brazil, for all of its sins, you know, and anthropology is not perfect anywhere, anthropologists are not silent about violence, like it's not, and they're not silent about Gaza. So the question is, why are we silent here? And this is something that I've thought about for a really, really long time, particularly as I came back to, um, to the UK from Brazil um, about eight years ago, and, you know, try to talk to my colleagues about anti-racism and anti-ableism, and was com re repeatedly shut down in the department that I was in at UCL at that time, or made fun of for trying to raise this as a serious issue. Obviously, after 2020, everyone is an anti-racist, okay? <laughs> and I'm not downplaying the importance of that work that has been done and the changes that have taken place in universities and in anthropology departments. But the question of why can anthropology only speak in the aftermath of something, yeah. right, is really important for us to think about. And anthropology in the UK, because it is not the case in anthropologies in the global south. Yeah. And I think it's important for us not to think that what anthropologists do here is what anthropologists do everywhere. Yeah. And I'm going to end there. We're going to have a problem because we're missing a chair. Very good. Yeah, they want, they want to make a statement. Yeah. Maybe when the QA begins. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, um, hello. I, I, I came here with, um, the, um, I had a great feeling about having this discussion at the beginning, and I, and I said, finally, it was about time um, to have this. And, uh, but uh, my colleagues, who I really I thank them for fantastically drafted uh, contribution today, really made me feel um, kind of overwhelmed by the coming together of, um, of different things. And I'm very humbled by the courage of people at Goldsmiths. I have to say, I have been as, as the, I've been for a period the, as a media role officer, so someone who works for the Association of the Social Anthropologists of the UK. I've been in touch with, with people at Goldsmiths facing cuts, facing management uh, clamp down now. And I, and I have to say, to be able to come here today while facing what you're facing there is, is uh, amazing. So thank you for being here. That's, that's thank you. I'm also someone, as Alice before, I never imagined myself to be standing in front of people uh, talking about, about Gaza. I'm an anthropologist of China. Um, I, I'm honored to be able to talk about this, and I, and I feel it is a responsibility. It also comes as a, a way of reciprocating Brownman, uh, who came to give a fantastic one hour long, ethnographically rich uh, uh, talk and away day organized for 30 years <clears throat> under students here at LSE. So I want to thank Brownman for that as well. That was amazing. Um, so, I'll, uh, so in my 15 minutes, I, I'm not going to be able to kind of, uh, you know, do, do, uh, do you justice. But um, here I am. Um, so uh, what I'm speaking from, I have nothing drafted that I'm just kind of speaking from, from the heart, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, I'm coming from a place where I was doing a lot of uh, um, uh, pro-Palestinian rallies when I was uh, uh, 17, 18. This was in Italy. This was during the Second Intifada, so during a moment where there was a lot of kind of uh, bus bombing as well. Uh, Italy is a context where you have a lot of police repression, so I was tear gassed against, I was uh, beaten, I was chased. Um, we used to be, and this was also the context in the kind of alter globalization movement w was very clever thinking about connection between the struggle in Gaza and Palestine and the global struggle against a neoliberal capitalism back then. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I think that that experience of, uh, of um, 
you know, being part of these rallies when I was very young really left an impression on me, especially uh, about topic that I shouldn't be exploring as a professional anthropologist that were too sensitive. So I moved to a different context after a while. And I ended up doing China, which is not a very clever thing to do, because, <laughs> because you're moving from a very repressive set of, I guess, institution, um, organizations, the state, but also corporation, who are forcing everyone to stay silent in a way, uh, to another place where surveillance is uh, performed on a very subtle level, even, even more sophisticated level, so to speak. So kind of the game uh, escalates. Um, and so I've been familiar for the past 15 years, I guess, or 20 years, as I've been researching China, of the various ways in which you are asked to stay silent or kind of uh, implicitly asked not to touch a particular topic. You are very um, kind of, you're primed not to be writing about things in particular ways. And this is, this is for me, with kind of Italian, with white, who's writing from a uh, position of privilege, imagine for uh, people in China writing about their own society, trying to kind of uh, cast um, a critical gaze on, on it. So um, I think, uh, I guess, well, one thing that I could do in the context of this is to try to think about what um, comes to light or kind of can be brought forward by looking at what is happening in Palestine and Gaza from the point of view, from China, so to speak, from the point of view of the experience that China has had with runaway military kind of uh, assemblage technology and development, uh, state oppression, and, and also kind of an attempt of, of uh, colonizing other regions, and we're talking about Xinjiang here. And so I think one, so what I would like to say in these 10 minutes is, uh, is just empirically speaking to, uh, make you uh, kind of expand the type of things that, that can be discussed when we discuss geopolitically about Palestine. So what is the Chinese role in, um, in the current crisis? What has been the position? What uh, kind of things that they have been doing? But also the fact that there are really deep historical, but also kind of um, economical connection between, between China and Israel, between China, the United States and Israel, uh, especially from the point of view of surveillance technology. And how these are used today in the context of uh, war in Gaza, in the, con in the context of uh, the repression of the Palestinian people and ethnic, ethnic cleansing as well. Uh, processes that really parallel what you see being done on the Uyghur people in Xinjiang today. Uh, and of course, in the discussion, we can be talking, kind of expand and talk more about this. So um, going back to China, China is a very um, interesting and ambiguous position in relation to the Palestinian Israeli context. So China recognized uh, Palestine as a nation state since 1988, uh, has been advocating for uh, this two states uh, kind of position in the United Nations for at least 20 years now. Um, they have been inviting uh, both, both Fatah and Hamas uh, to Beijing uh, recently to discuss the um, peace agreement that was proposed recently by the United States, or the kind of ceasefire, sorry, um, uh, in, in Israel, uh, um, but also to kind of, in a transactional way, to gain um, visibility and approval for the type of policies that are pursuing in Xinjiang and to clarify what the Chinese state is doing. So this is a province that was uh, historically we just cut to cut this story short, is a, a Muslim province in China that uh, around the, uh, the war on terror years after the Afghan war um, experienced an uptick of uh, terrorist acti activities, uh, mostly financed by, by Saudi Arabia. Um, in response, uh, the Chinese government, uh, of course, sent troops, but um, uh, really expanded the police system in the region by uh, creating internment camps in which now today are hosted more than one million people, whole uh, these people are uh, Uyghur people that have been uh, flagged by a system of uh, both kind of uh, very, you know, straight level policeman power and by a kind of surveillance technology that are designed to identify uh, particularly uh, threatening people in cities. They have been taken uh, without any kind of legal overview um, and taken away from their families and put in internment camps because they are suspects of, or potential terrorists and are being uh, going through a process of uh, kind of disintoxication from terrorism and kind of reformation of citizens as uh, a good Han uh, Chinese citizens. Uh, um, 
and, and so these policies have been contentious. China denied the existence of camps for a very long time until a very, a, a very good anthropologist, sometimes you think about anthropology, what is good for, and, 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 and sometimes you realize, well, anthropology is very good for in, in figuring out the camps, because Darren Baila was researching the jade trade in Xinjiang, from Xinjiang to Turkey, so a completely irrelevant and unrelated topic, and then all of a sudden interlocutors started disappearing. And so where is, where is this guy uh, gone? And then a police officer comes there and says, well, of course, we might want to stop uh, kind of researching this topic, but all these people you're working with are actually terrorists, and we are putting them in camps. And so, uh, and so he published this book now, Terror Capitalism, that details the history of the kind of um, establishment of this kind of surveillance internment camp system in China, in Xinjiang. And it's a, it's a great book, and I recommend everyone to read it. And also, so, uh, and sometimes you, you uh, sorry, this is a tangent, but I also have to say, you always, always ask what anthropology is good for until you realize that uh, anthropologists in authoritarian states are taken away because they are anthropologists. Mm, yeah. So, so uh, uh, Rail Dawood, who is a, a very famous uh, Uyghur anthropologist who researched folklore for 25 years, was sentenced to life imprisonment uh, six months ago. Um, by the Chinese government uh, for the reason of, not clear, uh, researching Uyghur culture. Anyway, so uh, going back to Palestine, so, so uh, as I was saying, uh, Xi Jinping government, so the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party had um, policy towards Palestinians, both trying to figure out partners they could support. So the leader of Fatah actually came to Beijing saying that the policies implemented against the Uyghur may actually make actually uh, sense uh, because these people are terrorists and, and this is in exchange for economic investments in, in well, promised economic investments because we haven't seen much. Mm -hmm. If we have seen something that this is all from Iran, so it might be Chinese money through Iran, but we don't know, we haven't seen anything concrete. On the other end, uh, the kind of ambivalent position um, is there because the Chinese investments in Israeli surveillance technology is massive. Mm -hmm. So Vision, which is a, a very big, um, uh, video camera uh, company that uh, both builds the surveillance camera that you have also around London. So this is a, a, a big, a big uh, multinational corporation, but with Chinese capital established in the early 2000s. And the technology, the software that runs through the camera and they can be trained through high, high technology to recognize particular patterns in behavior and uh, outlooks of people um, has been exported to Israel by China and is actually making a lot of money. So I had just one thing that I want to double check because this has to be right. So Ikvision now is making most of its profit by selling these cameras and this technology to Israeli military. They have more than 54,000 cameras in Israel and more than 35,000 cameras in Tel Aviv alone. Uh, and these cameras are used. So the, the interesting thing here to, to make sense of, uh, I said, runaway military technology, right? So what happened in the camps in Xinjiang is that they had, for the first time in the history of mankind, I guess, available to themselves a data set of more than one million people of which to train AI technology. So they started using these cameras on people in the camps to develop face recognition uh, software that could be then exported elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and this system is connected with kind of uh, pol uh, police uh, kind of anti-terrorist, uh, anti-threat system, whereby if then the camera spots that you are likely to be a Uyghur people, then you are more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, right? Just to make an example. This technology then is sold to Israel that is using this to both against uh, Israeli, Palestinian, uh, uh, and Muslim people in uh, Israel and in the war on uh, Palestine in Gaza. Um, this is useful because then um, so the literature, there is the work of one that is called a PhD students at Duke, another anthropologist that we might want to, you know, kind of use as a kind of reminder that anthropology may be useful sometime. Um, <laughs> Sophia good, sis, good friend, Sophia good friend is doing amazing work on uh, the use of surveillance technology developed in China, in Israel. And she has this idea of um, what is this, the idea, is uh, digital resignation. So the idea that once you empower police and the military to fall back on a kind of uh, um, digital technology that identifies threats for you, you actually stop thinking about what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? So uh, you see this with police arrest. You see these on our targets in Gaza have been identified as possibly potentially uh, connected to Hamas. 
the rate of bombing that we have seen and the rate of killing that we have seen was only possible because these digital technologies allowed for the targeting of more than 100 people by per minute, okay? Uh, there are interviews with military, Israeli military officials going on record saying before we couldn't produce more than 50 targets per, per minute. Now the technology is allowing uh, us to multiplicate and we just click a button and it, we are now inhabiting these worlds of where, where there's kind of a, uh, algorithmic war crimes, so to speak, right? Where you delegate the, the responsibility of committing war crime to algorithm. And this is possible just because of this connection mm -hmm. between, between uh, nations who have been solidly, consistently, disproportionately investing in military uh, apparatus. This is the United States. Again, I, if you read Darren Byler, you realize the Chinese companies actually profited a lot from uh, yes, I'm done. From, from um, American capital, American research done in public universities in California. So again, going back to the question of uh, what type of institution do we work for <laughs> and what do we want them to do? Uh, that's another question to ask. Uh, how come that these investments happen? How come that we do not have control over the type of technology that is developed out of these investments and um, et cetera? So um, yeah, so to conclude, I guess, that's depressing. But on the other end, uh, I mean, anthropologist is good as insofar as, you know, it gives you a sense of uh, interconnectedness of how violence is done. I mean, in my own work, I work on kind of how infrastructure kind of break down the social body across new fault lines and how people uh, experience violence through the mediation of infrastructure. I'm working on water infrastructure and we know how this is played out in, in Gaza as well, how uh, genocide is perpetrated by depriving people access to essential resources as well, right? And that's one of the definitions for why uh, you may call, want to call an action a genocide. Oh, the last point that I want to make. I have been involved in um, uh, thinking about connection. I am someone who works in the climate justice movement, and an issue that we have there is to start thinking about the connection between genocide and ecocide. Um, why is, is this the case? Because the military, uh, runaway military technology, as we said, is also one of the biggest CO2 emitters as, a, as an industry uh, in the world. Uh, by Kyoto and Paris agreements, nations are allowed not to disclose the CO2 footprints of their uh, military uh, uh, institution and, and, and um, kind of also military contractors, or also private contractors working on the military are exempted from that. There needs to be space for us to kind of start asking new questions about what it is that we do with the military, how it is that we want the military to exist, the type of investments that we, we do with it, and the type of harm that they do at large, uh, also on future generations as well. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, before we open it up for question answers, I want to invite our students um, who want to come and make a statement um, in solidarity. So I'm going to just give that space and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Hi guys. Um, basically, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Rwanda bill was passed two days ago, and yeah. ever since then, um, raids have been taking place across London, but also across the rest of the UK. Um, and I don't know if anyone's in the student staff solidarity chat, but I've kind of been spamming that out with a lot of the action that needs to be done today. And we thought it was really important with a captive audience, as you guys are, to kind of, um, kind of share what needs to be done within the next 24 hours but also beyond that um anyway so for context for those who haven't heard yesterday and today across the country police deputation vans and even coaches have been deployed to neighborhoods with high migrant populations and raids have been conducted to round up migrants transport them to the baby stockholm and eventually deport them to rwanda today many raids were carried out across london in peckham croydon and hounslow to name a few the people rose against these deportation projects stopping coaches and vans from leaving police conducted arrests at unexpectedly high levels um, protesters also attempted to de-arrest and in Peckham were kettled by riot police and TSGU, which is a particularly violent police tactic. Um, okay, so there's a few things that um, people need to get involved with and, and do, things we need bodies for. 
So first of all, it's really important that you follow your local anti-raids groups, follow them on social media, and keep an eye out for immigration vans. Some of them are labeled as immigration vans, but they're starting to use more ambiguous vans. There are pictures online, I'll share them in the group chat, but also uh, it's kind of, if you follow any of the deportation and anti-raids pages, they'll have um, vans online. The second step is to physically mobilize. Raids happen within moments notice and so do the counter actions. So keep an ear to the ground and get involved, of course. And also, third of all, legal training. GBC runs legal rights training for direct action online. There's one tomorrow evening, actually. There's one this evening, which we are currently missing. But it, <laughs> there's one tomorrow evening. Um, which also we can share the link to. But within the next 24 hours, there are calls for arrestee support at multiple police stations across London. Um, there are groups looking for volunteers to help with arrestees upon release up until 7 p.m. tomorrow. So if you happen to have a couple of hours spare and you can make it down to Walworth, Brixton or Islington, um, please get involved. We also can share the details for that. Um, and finally, if you can get to East Croydon for the foreseeable future, it's necessary to have people hang around the home office at Luna House to monitor activity and potentially block vans. There is a separate chat for this that you can access by contacting myself or Victoria. Um, but yeah, it's just really, really kind of feels like it's a war on all fronts right now. And I feel like the bodies that are the most active on the ground are also kind of the ones that have the most to use. And it's really easy to sit in rooms like this and talk about the academic and the intellectual, but we need bodies on the ground. It's more than theoretical right now, and it's more than a social experiment. Um, it's people's lives. But yeah, that's all. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to open it up for whoever wants to come and ask. Yeah, um, should we pass the mic? I can take it to Those mics, they don't work. Easy. They might work or not? You are saying you're going to walk around the mm -hmm. I mean, we can just, you can just speak. Uh, I, can, I can project yeah. my voice. Thank you very much. Uh, Sunny from my uh, social policy at the LSC. Uh, just a couple of reflections. Your, your talk about collective grievance, I think, is very interesting and important. I'm reflecting on Jill Butler's book on the force of non-violence, which is still to do with individual grief and grievability of life. And you're talking about um, about surveillance. Shiv, Shiv Hewer's work on Israeli surveillance is very, very important. And it's interesting, I've learned just recently that since 1962, India has had a connection with Israel to do with the Indo-Chinese War. So it's a very interesting set of parameters. But my main question to all of you was that you spoke about violence and you spoke of, sorry, you spoke about fear, you spoke about discomfort, and you spoke about silence. And I was thinking that these things have existed over time, mm. but what makes them different today? In other words, are the mechanisms of surveillance and the punishments uh, associated with that much more inclusive and underhand mm. that makes people more fearful to speak today than it did say 30 years ago? Yep. Would you guys like to just answer? Or Shall we collect some questions? OK. Let's uh, ask. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe we can collect a couple more, and then yep. we can answer them together. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Muslim and anthropologist also at QPL now. Okay. And I'm Palestinian in Lebanon. And I don't have a voice. So I'm Palestinian in Lebanon. It's part of the, the bomb that's waiting to explode. <laughs> that is the task of mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there is space for a system, or maybe I misunderstood what question we're trying to ask. Like we reflect on together. It's an invitation to reflect to, for everybody on what role do we have as a discipline in all of that. It's not as in, not as activists, not speaking up in the in our universities, but I'm thinking what is the I actually think anthropology is super valuable and for us who lived through like the revolutions in Egypt and the turmoil in Lebanon, there is a lot that anthropology can offer and much less uh, critical of it because of its flexibility as a discipline, because of its closeness to the people, the methodology opens up in so many ways. And I 
And we know from past work on Palestine that anthropology has been instrumental to giving voice to, for example, through oral history, what mm -hmm. Nakba is, uh, mm -hmm. the work of Rosemary Sayer in documenting, mm -hmm. giving space in history to what Palestinians have valued as their history and have tried in that. So I'm just, uh, it's a conversation that we're having. I'm also part of the ethnography and knowledge production in the Arab world working group. So we've had this conversation of what we do as anthropologists. There is not direct activism in the sense of five spaces, but what, how do we witness as people of the record of what's happening now? There are kind of work that we could be doing in terms of the experience of violence, what we're used to seeing through social media. Is there a role for us, those who are outside the space of danger, to um, create spaces to voice out the lived experience of people that are in Gaza in other ways? Is there a space for us to research think of uh, other imaginaries of the future? And also, what does that kind of the experience of Gaza, the genocide, that kind of wound that we're living in globally, how does it allow us to understand violence differently? And that experience of violence, because there is a lot, and I, not that I'm not an activist, I'm an activist, but there is also another way where the discipline has so much more to offer. I'm just wondering if we can, yeah. if I can let oh, thank you. your friends and... Yeah. Is there some another question that we can take before we answer? Yeah. Oh, there. Go ahead, please. Hi, I just want to say to the panelists that I found this. I'm Harriet. I'm associated with the Anthropological <coughs> team. And I just wanted to say to the whole panel, congratulations. And I found it deeply, deeply moving. And I'm sure that many people um, think that. And I think, you know, we have come together around Gaza. That I don't want to diminish that in any sense. What I do want to say, and I also want to thank the students for what you just said, and what comes to mind is that these issues are absolutely related to a single global system of racialization, um, which in Gaza takes a horrific form. It's much, you know, I, I don't want to make any kind of comparisons, but I also want to. Um, you know, there have been two references to other genocides going on in the world at the moment, in Brazil, in the Amazon, and in Xinjiang, in northwestern China. And I think the question that I was asked to begin with about why is anthropology silent, you know, now we're talking about Gaza, yes, and we need to talk about Gaza, and that is what is the main thing on the agenda right now, um, bringing lots of people together politically who don't necessarily think of themselves as being political subjects, but at the same time, in the long frame of things, we mustn't lose sight of all of these other issues going on, which is systemically related to what is happening in Gaza at the moment. Um, none of these things are inconsistent with each other. They're not contradictory. They can go together. I mean, it's a question, as Mark had all said, it's a question of deciding what is the main um, aspect of the contradiction at any at the current moment. It's Gaza. If I'd like to answer this, big one. Sure. Yeah. Shall we go in order or yeah, whichever, uh, whatever? Yeah, 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 you. Uh, no. Right. Um, it's always difficult to be the first one to start, first of all, because my own way of working, I need to warm up before I can really say some interesting things. But your question about the silence, right? And I like the way in which you talked about the implicit sort of, um, the way in which I think, again, comes from my political upbringing. I think that the, there is now more sort of a, a, a embodied form of restraint. You see what I mean? Of fear or anxieties in one way. And in a way that, that, that connects with what you just said there, 
right, in a sense. The reason why I felt like, for example, very anxious to come to talk about here is because one of the issues, because first of all, one of the colleagues got in trouble to talk about Gaza, right, at UCL, and that's very complicated and particularly, that's the reason why I wanted to avoid you know, talk about the trap of the divide between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. So I think here the question of the silence uh, and where we can speak now is because indeed I think anthropology now we are looking at sort of a very deep structural global sort of tension, right? And we see that in, in different elements. So we feel more comfortable to address them because many of the stuff that Sultan Julia and, you know, and my colleagues have, have mentioned about, you know, what's going on. I can feel it even though I work on techniques and technology. So I think now, nowadays, I think that there is another form of silence here, which is unrestrained, which is totally integrated with fear, right? With fear of speaking. One of the dimensions that connects to that, and what I'm going to say, I hope it's not too provocative, but from the last 20 years, I always felt a bit discouraged you know, a form of discomfort about identity politics, right? The raise of the, you know, of the revendication and recognition of identity politics, whatever they are. And I always was a bit surprised that, I mean, suddenly over the last 10 years, we started to talk about intersectionality, right? Because for me, from the, my point of view, the political violence that exists around the globe has always been intersectional. They are di it's different guises, it's always, you know, all of that. So I think, in a sense, what this particular series of events invites us to do is it might be a, a, a shock, indeed, to us that provokes us to actually start to speak about those, those effects. I don't know what type of answer we can, we can have, but the question you were asking about what can anthropology do, that's also another provocative thing that I've said. I've been part of many decolonizing anthropology and you know, criticizing anthropology for its colonial past. And position has always been, yes, anthropology is a colonial discipline, right? But it has always been a thorn in colonialism from the beginning, right? Even when Lewis Henry Morgan, who is a bad man evolutionist, starts his book by saying, we need to start stop killing the Iroquois. So I think anthropology has indeed a voice, and, and, and we need to, to draw upon that to actually reveal those dimensions, talk about intersectionality, talk about the fact that it's not only about gender, not only about race, but this is a global sort of, uh, um, and, and very pernicious, like a form of like, you know, poisons that zip into different aspects of the relation between the individual and the collectives, right? So I think that as anthropologists, we've got the actual empirical means to reveal that. I work on technology, right? Some of my colleagues think like, you know, it's not very interesting. I work about how you make parts, right? I work also how you make algorithm. But I can tell you, and you know, and thanks to the many students I've got the privilege to work with, we can demonstrate that in those many things we can see the same poison. I can't put my hand on the poison. What you were talking about, the poison. I can't put my hand on the poison. I've got several words for it, but that's not the aim here. What I think is happening now in Gaza, and that's sort of like, again, as I said, the new iteration of a long sequence of historical events, right? And what it provokes, the discomfort it provokes, the tension it provokes, right? I think is indeed a moment of revelation, and that may be what invited me to speak, even though I've got nothing to do with that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess in a way you're right. Um, what's, what's the fear now? Hasn't this always existed? I think we inhabit the world, I mean, to kind of start very broad, but then actually think to decenter also our own world. I think the move that Julia also made that maybe we're silent in the UK. If you look at the anthropology of Palestine in the US, it's a very vibrant field. There's like really amazing work being done on all kinds of levels. Speak about ecocide, speak about um, the housing market, speak about settlements, speak about water rights, water infrastructure. So the silence, I mean, there are different things here when we think about why the fear now. I think being stigmatized and demonized with extreme legal consequences is much larger. I mean, Didia Fassa said that the, there's a disproportionate level of punishment for very minor crimes in our time, 
right? And I should also add that many things that happen in Germany in my own research context, they're actually not happening on a legal level. So the IRA definition of anti-Semitism is not legally binding. BDS is banned, but not legally banned. But actually to come out and say, I am you know, uh, refuting that definition, or I'm actually going against the BDS ban, it will mean your social death. It will mean that you will be excluded from all kinds of institutions, public institutions, state-funded institutions. People will dissociate. So what other world is left for you? I think, you know, I don't want to like totalize this, but there's a level of totalitarianism in this. So that's, that's one thing. So what, what makes people more fearful? I think that's one element um, that it can be totalizing. The other element is that Am I too close? Yes. Is this better? Sorry, yes. So, yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I also have a, okay, I have a sinus infection also, so I always think that I don't really sound like myself. Um, the other thing also, of course, is that um, we live with a story that we tell ourselves here. Again, we center Europe as the pinnacle of all kinds of rights and living standards and possibilities. So, and I want to I want to take this question like why do we do this um, to Mesna's um, actually list of questions, right? And I, I do agree with you, and I think I, I thank you for bringing out the witness part. Um, there's something beautiful that anthropologists actually do. You know, you really go and 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 work with people. You get to understand them, and you kind of also understand how narrow you are yourself in your own thinking, right? How there there is more to the world how there are other ways of being in the world. So that, you know, kind of to produce counter-archives, counter-narratives, counter-knowledge. The question is like, where do you take this knowledge to? Mm -hmm. who, who, is, who is helping you? Who's enabling you? I think we live on a global scale of precarity that in a way is unprecedented. And I think the story of Palestine is also one of making a rooted people precarious not just legally precarious, but like really taking away the possibility to have an alternative, a different form of life, right? I mean, so there is the question of funding, Yazan Khalili, who works on this, right? How can you do art funding? How can you produce art in an occupied space when there is no such thing as like regular funding, right? So you kind of build collectives, uh, you come around certain things. So then even um, building a school or uh, taking care of livestock becomes both of your world, worldly practice, your survival, but also part of your art practice, right? So the, the other futures, okay? I think the, the question there that I really appreciate is really also like, are we able to imagine a different future beyond the capitalized university, beyond the kind of capitalist production of knowledge? How do we do this, right? What's the telos of our production as anthropologists? So these are my... Suggestions. Okay. Do I need to talk? I'm all right. Okay. Um, they're all really good questions. I don't really know where to start. I think what I'll start with is in relation to um, the question of what the value of anthropology now, which I think is like really mobilizing for me. Um, was really mobilizing in the invitation to come and speak here um, today. Um, and um, I agree with Sultan, the question of witness thing, right, in terms of all of the other things that anthropologists can offer, right? And um, the beauty of that and what keeps us in the discipline despite all of the other stuff um, that we know is there, basically, um, the discipline has so much to offer, but the question for me, and I think this relates to what you're saying, is that how do, how do we allow for that? Like, and I think this is particularly important for us to think about in the UK, right? When we're talking about precarity, and we're talking about who is allowed into these intellectual spaces, and who can actually stay, right, beyond PhDs, or even get into a PhD in the UK and get funding for that, you know, it's um, you only stay if you produce knowledge in a certain kind of way and you're constantly evaluated for that. So all of the beautiful potential that there is in our discipline gets completely um, squashed down by that, 
you know? And the curious thing for me, and the thing that makes me particularly angry, is that our colleagues, that other anthropologists who are reproducing persistently these metrics of evaluation, these forms of evaluation for what counts as anthropological knowledge and what doesn't count as anthropological knowledge, what counts as anthropological witnessing and what doesn't count as anthropological witnessing, you know? And I think like I can speak from my position, maybe Sultan can speak something else. At the moment, the situation at Goldsmiths is that we are being interviewed for our own jobs and part of that is that we're being evaluated for the number of um, four-star publications that we have produced in the last four years during a pandemic, okay? And then, you know, with all of the upheaval that we've had at Goldsmiths, right? So all of the work of critiquing, of participating in events like this that I've done in the last four years don't count. All of the witnessing that I do and the kind of, um, you know, the different kind of like creative kind of things I think about in terms of witnessing and what anthropology is and what anthropology could be don't count. There's nowhere in that form for me to put there that is going to be taken seriously by the people who are evaluating me. And these are things that are being reproduced by anthropologists anthropologists who are senior colleagues who are reproducing the ways that people are evaluated. So I think you're right, anthropology has amazing potential. I don't know if that potential is ever going to go anywhere, to be quite honest, right now. Like, I hope it will, and I'm still here, you know, trying it out. But I'm also prepared for the fact that the way that I work might not have much more space, in the UK at least, you know, in the foreseeable future. And so I'm constantly talking with my partner about going back to Brazil, constantly. Um, the other questions, I think, um, in terms of the global system of racialization, absolutely. And I think that it's really important for us to keep that in mind. Um, and the other genocides, the indigenous genocide in, in China, but it, in so many other places that are taking place, as well as, you know, the force, the forcible movement of people from the UK and the danger that people are being put, put in um, with, um, with the, as the students pointed out um, really well, and the importance of participating in that, in the, in the resistance towards that, um, as well as being allowed to create spaces such as this where there's the specificity of going what's going on in Gaza in the face of the silence um, that we are seeing, in the face of the fear, which to me is, you know, is again goes back to the situation that we're going through in, in Goldsmith. Like, I don't know what my participation in this event is going to mean for, <laughs> for how I'm evaluated at Goldsmith. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things, but I think that it's worth doing, and to be honest, if it, if it means, what, what it means in terms of the commitment to the production of knowledge and methodology in a different way is that it means that potentially you're excluded from that space and that you have to, you know, sit with that. Andrea, did you want to add something? Or Ludo had I, I, I think, uh, I... I don't have anything to add with what Julia just said. I think it's, uh, and I don't want to detract from the message, so I'm not going to say anything. I think that's the message. The, the only thing that I could add, uh, now I'm no longer a media officer for the ASA, <laughs> so I can say something about the ASA. Now, um, we had moments where discussion were had, in the, so the, we are not uh, um, kind of elected. We are volunteering into this position, that, 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 so that doesn't give us enough power to represent anyone, membership or represent anthropology in the UK. It's just, you know, in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a quasi association because we're, we are not um, really able to speak for the profession. But having said that, we have had discussion about what position to take uh, relative to events after the 7th of October, whether or not it is, there is opportunity for us to be uh, kind of issuing a message, also seeing what the, the parallel association in Europe did, uh, which was quite overtly taking a position. And, and, and so I'm not going to be making names, but what happens in this uh, context is that you are met with a particular 
degree of whataboutism, so to speak. So if you if you raise the question of, you know, Gaza, then someone's going to yeah. raise the question of, well, we haven't said anything for the Rohingya. So and someone else is going to say, well, have you seen what's happening in Darfur? Or are you, are you, are you, you know, Africanists yeah. will be very disappointed with, with the statements like this. And, um, in, and so I don't have much to say about what about this, but only that it resembles a lot what happens in China, where anyone, uh, Chinese citizens or kind of foreigners, make a point that things may be slightly better in China if some of the policies that they have, especially, for instance, during the COVID pandemic, could have been uh, changed, right? And then the Chinese government usually say, but have you seen what's happening here? Have you seen what's happening there? So how can you blame us? So that position is really disempowering for everyone. Mm -hmm. And because it exists within hierarchies, within academia, also within the association, Mm -hmm. People are not really able to speak up. Everyone start immediately be concerned about what, what career stage are you, how long you're going to be uh, have to stay here, uh, what particular place are you speaking for. There are there are hierarchies between institutions in the UK. So you know, you're speaking from an LSE, you have a particular power. Mm -hmm. You speak from a non-Russell group post 1992 institution, you have a different kind of power. That is. Um, that is on everyone's mind. Never, it never gets articulated in a particular kind of um, formal way. And it exists in this kind of atmosphere, right? Where people adjust to the, to the to, to whatever atmosphere is imposed by the majority. And, and the ASA has a very old membership. Keep in mind here, yeah, ASA has a very old membership. We are not able to recruit new members because of precarity, because no one sees why they should pay into the institution, so into the, into the association. So, so, so you're then, looking for new members. No, well, I, I, I was actually tasked to do this, and then at one point, I, and it was never, I was never able to actually deliver that particular um, workshop with PhD students to recruit them into the association. Also, because things started becoming a bit sour for me mm. uh, after um, after seeing uh, inaction in, in in the association. So. So that's the only thing I've done. Can we have another round of questions? Yeah, but I wanted to reply okay. to one specific, or you know, comment on one of uh, Julia's um, discussion about the, the the particular form of, of knowledge production within anthropology. I, I I would argue, Julia, that this is that, but it's because it's actually a, a battle which is already lost that they are you know, trying to maintain those standards of academia, because what is happening at, you know, in the university now is the fact that it's not about research and publication anymore. It's about student and fees and particular, you know, see what I mean? It's the administration, actually, what I see at UCL, it's really about, you know, the NSS, the effect of the NSS on the TEF, much more than the REF, because one of the things that uh, I've heard within our department which is said not necessarily officially, is research doesn't bring any money. It's teaching that brings money. So there is a lot more, mm -hmm. much more emphasis on, on administrating the students, making sure they come, they are happy and they pay the fee than producing a four-star sort of paper. So basically trying to think that you're going to protect the discipline by, you know, yeah. it, it's actually, it, it's completely erroneous because we way past beyond that and it's becoming more and more like that. Yeah. Can I so, just... Get more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. That was just like minutes. my cor um, small corrective. Thank you, and thank you for some really fascinating interventions. Um, I'm wondering if this doesn't push us to reflect beyond silence to the process of silencing. Yeah. And I'm thinking particularly about the weaponization of anti Semitism by the political right mm. in the US. In the UK. <coughs> as a mechanism for silencing more progressive voices. Um, and I'm thinking of weaponization. Uh, Anti-Semitism is itself being weaponized, not only against Muslims and against non-Jews, but against Jews themselves. Mm. Yeah. And a whole lot of silencing yeah. of large segments of yeah. the Jewish population who are told what kinds of opinions they're entitled to have and which kinds of opinions are inappropriate or can't be heard. I'm thinking of the, the cancelling of award ceremonies and events in yep. Germany, uh, often involving Jewish people expressing their own experiences and thoughts. So I'm wondering if one of the issues that anthropology might think about is a kind of anthropology of silencing. Mm -hmm. And the infrastructure, the institutional and political and even physical infrastructure of this silencing, which involves the media and a whole series of lobbies, um, the uh, ways in which uh, university administrations are being mobilized, 
in anthropology, one of its great strengths is the ability to trace infrastructures, sometimes not just physical infrastructures, institutional infrastructures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and figure out how things connect together to make other things happen. And one of the things that definitely has struck me very powerfully in the Gaza moment is this process of silencing an enormous infrastructure that is uh, operating behind mm -hmm. it. And it's incredible effectiveness for making people feel that they cannot speak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And on the more hopeful side, the anthropology then of resistance. And it's really interesting that in U.S. Um, student occupations, particularly in Colombia, the hall that was occupied was also previously occupied around the Vietnam War protests yeah. and around anti-apartheid. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there, there is a a whole process of resistance to address this kind of silencing that moves through a different set of infrastructures mm -hmm. um, that are things that maybe we could look at when the first anthropology of silencing makes us feel. Mm -hmm. Someone over Um, so first of all, um, thank you so much for the bravery. I think um, I don't want to dwell too much in terms of anthropology as a practice because I think you guys have covered it really, really well. But um, being a student from the Global South, right, and being a student from a country where Palestine has pretty much, I, I'm going to say the word Palestine, I hope you guys don't mind, right, to whoever that, you know, Palestine has pretty much been part of our becoming. My big fear is when we are coming here is that we are losing the language to talk about it mm. as anthropology, mm. right? And and let me let me tell you an example, right? So, um, one of the one of the folks who are very very active in the Palestine protests are actually people from the gender studies, right? And 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 I think the reason and, and it's actually very very related to. Judith Butler's thoughts for the reasons, you know, why they're very active, why Palestine is their cause and all that stuff. And, and, and I think sometimes what happens is that why anthropology is silent, especially taking a student perspective, is we, we just don't have the language to complement that in return. Mm -hmm. So to usually, like, my friends will come and ask me, like, what does anthropology think about it? And what I'm meaning is it's not just based on ethnography. Really, I'm talking about a perspective, a concept, a value. Now, um, so let me give you a, a bit of an example of my personal experience. Um, actually, it's regarding Julia's point, right? Um, something that really hit me, which is, though it's specifically to why anthropology in the UK is silent about it, right? But maybe I want to add a bit more. It's academia in the UK being silent about it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure if you're aware of it, the London Review of Books tried to make a public lecture with Pankaj Mishra lecturing about Shoah after Gaza, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> it almost didn't happen because the Barton Centre cancelled it. And when it happened instead, it was it was quite bizarre because you have somebody from who is an Indian public intellectual living in the UK lecturing, well, pretty much you know a hall with this kind of demographic and this kind of size on a topic that supposedly is far away from him. Yeah. But he pointed out a very interesting point, which is he, he, he came into the question of why, why do the Global South actually care about Gaza so much? Mm -hmm. He said it in a very, very yeah. eloquent way. I mean, you can agree or disagree, which is he said it as because enough people in the Global South knew how it was like to be colonized and the fact that we are still living mm -hmm. with the trauma of it. Mm -hmm. That for us, looking at Gaza is also looking at history. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking at history repeating itself, yeah. looking at history yeah. unfolding itself. And when we compare it to a post-war order that built itself on human rights, on not letting the Holocaust happen again, we, we immediately felt that outrage, a moral outrage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it comes back to, all right, how am I going to bring out an anthropology? Which comes back to... Um, I think so. you mentioned roughly that point where anthropology is very region specific. 
And I think that's the reason why I struggle to have the language because I, when we go out and say we rage about Palestine, right? We don't just mean Gaza specifically. It's a moral outrage. Yeah. It's the fact that look, when you when you see dispossession and you see mass rape, right? Why is it that the world doesn't seem to come to the rescue? Yeah. Right? Is that a violation of human rights? Is that a violation of what we have believed for a good eighty years after the second? So then it comes back to the fact that are we missing the language of connectivity, right? What we're talking about is the fact that somebody who migrated here to the UK, maybe coming from a post-colonial country, maybe coming from Gaza, is actually something emblematic of a, of a broader historical trend. Mm -hmm. It's something that's emblematic of a kind of system that perpetuates itself, right? And, and my view is... My fear is that, you know, by being region specific, we, we kind of allow a bit of a cop out, right? Which is, again, it goes down a bit like what Andrea said, which is, oh, if you're talking about Gaza, why don't you talk about Kashmir? Why don't you talk about Ukraine? Why don't you talk about, you know? It becomes this false moral equivalence. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the sort of narrative that we need to shift, which is anthropology isn't just talking about a region. We mm -hmm. are actually talking about a fundamental value, a fundamental system. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that really goes back, and I think by explaining that, it, it can really go back to the point of why so many of us are very outraged about it, right? I think a lot of, I think a lot of us, we may not even necessarily come from the Middle East, right? I think some of us do even come from the global north part of the world, and I think that's the beautiful thing about it, right? But I think what has been missing a lot is the fact that this underlying tune that we all felt the same, right? So, so that's pretty much what I really want to emphasize for you, it's, it's the language of it. Yeah. Hi. <coughs> okay, one question. Okay. I um, apologize because I, I came late, but one of the reasons I wanted to come was because um, I wanted the panel's opinion on, I guess, pedagogy and praxis. So mm -hmm. when you're working with students, I have a number of students that I coach and mentor. Some of them, I mean, of course, you're at LSE, you're taught, you're a global citizen, like, use your values to work towards what you care for and make a difference. But then when you start doing that, the doors are shut in your face or mm. you're getting threatened or passive aggression. And, mm. and the people that are meant, that are telling you these same things are also the people telling you to be silent. And, and so I, I guess from a pedagogical and practice approach for anthropology, mm. what, how do you approach that student? How do you mentor that student? And also know your own precarity yeah. in some of these things. Um, and, but the, the reality of their precariousness being further, <laughs> I don't know how else to, mm. to yeah. put it. And, and, and just being precarious together, like I don't, I, don't know how else, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but what is your thoughts on that? What are your approaches? What tips do you have? Mm. Um, if you have a very quick question to ask, and then we can put it in, and it could be the closing comments that there's the panel a, gives. There's a hand. More like an observation, just listen to what you're saying. It's like, in my, in my experience, like my experience of silence, for example, in college in particular, because you know that many people don't know in their lives what's happening in Gaza. But with other anthropologists, it's like, what happens when you feel Is there another join? You have to be very quick. From past, I know that's not always the case. <laughs> Come on, we love to yield. But <laughs> I mean, try and be really quick. I mean, there's a thank you. Thank, thank you, you. to you. <laughs> so, uh, Timmy Borgia makes this comment about that. Unless we face things, mm. we can't have change. Yeah. Well, yeah. We must recognize that. Without, you know, like we don't always get change unless we 
We have to recognize there's limits. Mm -hmm. So by being silent over the thing, nothing's ever going to change. Yeah. You can do something. So it's a famous quote by Jimmy Wood, and I've only mangled it. But the, the thing I want to see is that I came here today because we talked, obviously, for my colleagues that are here, friends and anthropology and my knowledge. But also <laughs> the fact is that if we're asking what can we do, then the obvious thing is that this is missing from the equation starting about power. We've been raised and socialized in this myth about living in a world space builder and what very eyes we're seeing lies we can't see. Mm -hmm. Anthropology is mm -hmm. brilliant at that. about witnessing about the mm. things that we can do. Well surely I think Laura Naden writes about um, studying upwards. This is a great opportunity not just to study violence, which you must do, but to study power. How did this happen? We're not in yeah. Palestine right now. We <coughs> certainly that we cannot do as anthropologists, but surely what we could be doing now is looking at how did the media, how did the political how did the institutions enable this silencing to take place? Mm -hmm. What can we do to prevent it from ever happening again? And as anthropologists embedded in these systems of abusive power, surely that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Students, uh, academics, teachers, mm -hmm. educators alike. So I just really want to kind of tease about the idea mm -hmm. of A, studying upwards and looking at power and exposing this moral hypocrisy of the cyber power, and also studying the violence and disposable violence. Why are we, who as close to have uh, academic uh, like privilege, our voices are able to, to talk truth to power? Why are we self censoring? And I think someone talked about precarity, and I think all these kind of issues are, are real. So that's really you know, very short. Sure, <laughs> um, before I ask you to just make closing comments focusing on these questions, I'm just going to abuse my role as moderator for one second to say that. Your question about language and your question about silencing is linked, right? One of the reasons why we yeah. don't have language is that it reveals in these moments the racism within anthropology, right? So the moment that you try to have a language about your moral outrage, you become a native informant and not an anthropologist, despite having all that skill. So your moral outrage might be because you're post-colonial or you're Muslim or you're this, which is something that I experience all the time, right? That when I want to speak about Palestine, it's like, oh yeah, you must want to because you're Muslim. And it takes away the fact that I might be in a discipline not because I'm Muslim. And so the kind of ways in which your silence and your language is taken away from you by completely putting you in a different box, I think is, is, is part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna Definitely. let you guys close in exactly five minutes. <laughs> For all of us, five minutes? Well, I mean, Ricardo told Don't me that we it. really can't have the room after 7.30. Okay. Okay, well. So, well, I, let's see what they let's do. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Start. Yeah. I'm not starting. <laughs> no. uh, uh, I'll t I'll, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's a puzzle. There's a lot. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Um, I want to speak about the weaponization of anti Semitism. Okay. Um, I didn't speak a lot about this before because I wanted to cover other things, but you know. I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. Like all of my family on my mother's side, my paternal, my, my mother's father's family, my mother's mother's family, most of them died in Auschwitz, okay? Um, and it has been like this thing, you know, for me, watching this happen consistently, not just since October, right? But persistently, the way that anti-Semitism is weaponized, and persistently, the way that I am made to feel like I am not Jewish enough, because I don't agree with what is happening, you know? And that if I voice that in some way, in the Jewish community in the UK particularly, but also in Brazil, I am not Jewish enough. And so I think that silencing is happening within the Jewish community. And it is really, really important for us to talk about that, you know? And for those who have Jewish heritage, like myself, but who are mixed, you know? My dad's Lebanese, my mom's Jewish. There's a whole of lot of other crazy mixes in there, okay? Like my dad's indigenous Lebanese Amazonian, my mom is Jewish. There's like, we have to be able to stand and speak, you know, and I think that is really important, actually, not silencing ourselves and actually take, you know, talking about this because it is being weaponized. And um, I think that, you know, we come from a position where we can, 
you know, really talk about it and say that it's, it is the moral outrage which is happening in Gaza and it's not something that represents me in absolutely any way as the granddaughter of the Holocaust survivors. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that I wanted to speak to. Um, and I think also there's something very important that you're talking about in terms of the anthropology of silencing that relates to that, right? Because, for example, within my own family, the experience of the Holocaust is something that was silenced for a really, really long time and which led to a series of, I don't know, like, I cannot tell you the level of mental health issues that I faced in my family, in my mother's family, which has to do with that silencing and with that repression. And so what are we getting ourselves into with all of this silencing and the repression of violence and the repression of memory of violence and the kind of long-term consequences of that, right? I am like two generations from the Holocaust, the long-term consequences of that for the Palestinian people. And that is something that really like is on, at the forefront of my mind when I'm talking about, you know, violence and the consequences of violence. This is going to last generations. Right? We're talking about this now. This is going to go on for generations. What's happening now is going to have consequences for the next 100 years, if not more. So I think it's really important for us to talk about that and to think about it anthropologically as well. And there's some really interesting studies about silence and forgetting, I think, that are really important to, to think about in relation to that. Um, and I think... That's where I'm going to leave it, because um, I think other people have other things to say. Okay, I'll be quick. When it comes to the anti-Semitism def definition, I think there's no other definition in the world when it comes to racism that centers a state. Human yeah. rights are not about states to begin with. Yeah. The history of the Holocaust is about the stateless people. It's a decolonial history to begin with, because they were colonized and then exterminated. So, but what happened with that history after the end of the Cold War is a rediscovery and a retelling of the story for a politics of human rights, as many others have already written about this, in painting this as a moral picture of like good versus evil, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's also hard to talk, you know, like when I teach my, I taught in a, a Holocaust and Genocide Studies um, Center, and I had students who read about trauma in Palestine and humanitarian help and human rights, and they said, whatever happened to resistance? You know, we used to read Ghassan Kanafani. We used to have a different language. There was the global south trying to like, you know, build a uprising, an art resistance. And I'm like, yeah, what happened? You know, I myself, I noticed, I, I went with the shift, right? And I, I kind of like was like, okay, this is the language we have, as you're saying beautifully. And I think, you know, the language, and this is what I want to say, like the, one of the things that we do as anthropologists when I early on said, look, I did not work on Gaza or on Palestine, but in, in Germany, it kept popping up, right? So the, this regional specificity did not help me because I could see there are all these global connections and yet these global connections are dominated by a particular notion and institution of like what the human is in human rights and how we tell that story. And that story is inherited through these institutions. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Jews themselves becoming targets, mm -hmm. right, is those Jews who do not align themselves with the nation state project of Zionism, mm -hmm. right? They become targets. So on the question of like silencing, anthropology of silencing, I do, you know, for me, it's securitization what's going on here. Mm -hmm. It's policing. We're being micro-policed, micro-securitized. The things that give us freedom and expression like Instagram and Facebook are the ones that are being used against us all the time, right? This is where you produce evidence. Say, oh, you posted this, you like this. I know so many of my interlocutors who lost their jobs for liking a post, okay? So in that sense, silencing, you know, is part of a larger... Um, I would say global policing structure, and I think mm -hmm. you brought that out really well, right? Um, but then, what is the what is the task here? What do we do? And I really like your question about yeah. like what you described. I know this so well of like teaching, you know, radical thought and the global citizen. And I actually have a student yeah. sitting here. Maybe I failed. She can tell you later yeah. behind. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know, it is really interesting because we, we live in a, in a time of absolute contradiction when it comes to this, right? If, if I want to be a global citizen, I have to be positioned somehow, somewhere with a certain language. But if the only position given to me is the one of complicity, mm -hmm. is the one of conscription mm -hmm. into a modernist project that is actually genocidal, mm -hmm then I'm not teaching citizens who actually can speak up and kind of learn also like what to do with their knowledge and co-govern. I'm just producing slaves to follow, right? Mm -hmm. And my own following comes from this idea of like, okay, I'm precarious, what do I do? I had students complain about me in a different job for being anti-white, okay? <laughs> so, and I had to like kind of really like write out what I said and that I actually didn't even mention that person's color, that I don't actually do that. But that person who was a white student who thought it was good to protest for the Iraq war and who brought that up in class and I said, okay, so why do you think this was a good thing? She thought that question was me putting her down and her ideals, okay? So this brings me back to the student point and like what really counts. You count, you guys count a lot, okay? We're many anthropologists here, we're many thinkers here. And there's a shift, there's a generational shift. The reason we're seeing this ugliness is that we're actually shifting mm -hmm. from a unipolar world with its narrative and kind of like a monopoly on human rights that is not holding together. Mm -hmm. We're actually being born into a different world at the moment that is multipolar, that needs all kinds of languages, that needs all kinds of forces, and that needs a new generation to kind of think and say, we don't want this kind of whatever, education, citizenship, governance, right? And, you know, the university is your first institution to express that, really. So, yeah, you can do a lot. What can we do? Can I just add one thing to that? I think also with that, right, with the fact that it, there is no, I think for a long time there's this idea, and it's still there, that democracy somehow, or that the reality, like the possibilities of democracy sit here, Okay, they exist here alone. There are so many democratic projects going on in the world, like, you know, experimentation. And that is something also that students need to be encouraged to look at in terms of what it means to be part of a collective or community of a nation state in very different ways that's taking place in other places in the world. Um, if Ludo and Andrea are okay with it, could we yeah, close no, at this no, also, point and we can continue the discussion, <laughs> hopefully at um, up afterwards, to which we invite all of you to come we with go us. Here, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Go. yeah, 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 that's great. That's okay. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Are you sure? I mean, you no, I, I, should we, should we <laughs> say something? I'm, I'm, let's I'm, say I'm something. I've got a couple okay, of things okay. to say. <laughs> I want, okay. Actually, no, why don't you say something? I'm Both of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Thank guys. You. I was going to move. It's a pedagogical I... answer to the very good question about education. I mean, one point is how you deter institute, how you re kind of occupy, reclaim institution to your own practice, right? So you have this space now. Let's make use of this space for having the kind of discussion that we want to have. And if we have, if we overstay, just overstay, right? So one part of the pedagogy has to do kind of realize that this is a opportunity and you know these are, there are a lot of my students here so we we do this all the time it's an opportunity to be in a place like lsc it's a it's a platform as resources as spaces mm -hmm. how can we use these resources for our own ends the detouring of a powerful institution is one first step and you need to do it every time you can yeah the other things is to cultivate a sense of autonomy from spa mm -hmm. spaces like these it doesn't really matter if you don't end up getting a, a job uh, in anthropology because anthropology is a small discipline. It's relevant insofar as it is relevant. There are, there are disciplines that are much more interesting and you need to kind of have a discussion <laughs> with your students yeah. about yeah. there are so, so many other uh, disciplines that are populated by anthropologists you can have a discussion with. There is, you know, black studies, there is indigenous studies, there is uh, actual research, there yeah. is all sorts of sub-branches of anthropology that are little known, but are amazing. And, and perhaps this is, it, it's, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, if you really want to do this, and I, I'm speaking from a position where I ended up doing this, even though I was very lucky, and that's the reason why I'm doing this, and, you know, out of the many jobs I applied to, I, I got this one. I was very lucky. That's the end of the story. But the, the point being that the expansion of the imagination of your students is the priority. 
mm. right? Yeah. You yeah. need to expand the futures that they can have, especially because genocide, ecocide are narrowing the, that uh, window of opportunity. Yeah. People feel they can't do anything. When the reality is that if you come from a place like this, you can do a million things that are much better than ending up doing the administration that I do all the time. Okay? <laughs> so that's one point. Also outside academia. Outside, outside, of, academia, academia, outside, outside of, academia. of academia. Outside of academia. Outside of academia. What is this space for? I mean, we can talk about private and public institutions. And I, I, I come from a public system. And there are reasons for eighteen public systems as well. I mean, academia is one place. It's not the only place. One thing about silence, about infrastructure, just one example of how this works, and it's kind of really for, for us. Well, there is a great book from, from a Chinese scholar who is called Margaret Hillebrand that is called Negative Exposure. And if you're interested in silence, you need to read that book. It's about how silence doesn't equate to acquiescence with the ruling authority. It is about the repression of a Tiananmen uh, massacre. Mm -hmm. and it is how it is maintained through generations in China. And that's a great book. Um, and it can teach us a lot about silence. But one thing that happened to me with students of public anthropology, so Phoebe is not here, so it happened to our students who is not here. So we, uh, one way to kind of use um, the opportunity that I have uh, and the resources that I have as one worker at LSE is by publishing an open access journal about China that can be read everywhere, okay? Um, on the journal, we published a number of articles about the connection between China and Palestine. There is this one article that I drew from today to, to talk about surveillance that is by Darren Beiler and collaborators. And it is about this, this kind of technology and software that are used against, um, uh, against the Palestinian citizens in Israel. Um, she reposts, so we discussed this in class, uh, Phoebe goes online on her Instagram, she reposts this uh, article, uh, making a few points about what it meant to her. Her Instagram account is frozen for one week with no explanation. So, it, it, I mean, it is pervasive. And I know, I edit, you know, Google Docs documents uh, talking about, you know, China, and then sometimes some kind of anonymous user uh, pops up into the system and monitors me and then disappears. And I never know who, this, who they are. And so, and this is also fair, you know. The fact that these is kind of infrastructure are completely unaccountable, completely impermeable, invisible, they still operate in a way that you do not know how they operate. Mm -hmm. And that creates, a feeling that surveillance is everywhere, even though perhaps it's not everywhere, right? There is the kind of the fear of surveillance is more mm -hmm. powerful than yeah. surveillance itself. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a language that we can use as well, right? Yeah, thank you. I can't believe you guys are going to make me the defender of the discipline, right? But I feel that, you know, but no, in a sense that I, I want you to, um, I would like us to be very careful about what we do when we do that, because on the one hand, when we say that, that means that you know we should close anthropology departments, and uh, because you know it's not they say it's a small discipline and it's not very useful. But at the other end, I think that you know, I think anthropology is more crucial, and training people mm. as anthropologists is politically more crucial than ever, mm. because one thing that we are very good at actually answer a couple of the questions that we're talking about, right? You were talking about the, the region and, you know, the, why does the global south care about Gaza? It's because they are comparing. And one of the fundamental elements of anthropology is indeed comparison based on the knowledge that <coughs> living with empathically, morally, with the communities we are actually supposed to study. And I think that's a very important element here. And there is a lot of uh, move against the comparative project of anthropology. And what you said, and, and the fact that you guys invited us here, is actually going back to what anthropology is. Yes, I can study yams in New Guinea or Trobriams or whatever, and I can come and talk about thinking what's happening in Gaza. And I think that's a very important part. And that's even more important that we feel, I feel, that there is a global attack on anthropology mm. in itself as a discipline. The problem is this attack comes from outside, as we see in Goldsmiths, but also from inside, by yeah. keeping accusing anthropology of being a colonial discipline, as being sort of, you know, this type of stuff. And I think that's really problematic there. So I think that we need also to think together about how to, what is anthropology today and why is it important? So that's one thing. Mm. So that's my reaction, get reaction to that, that gets me very inflamed because- We're gonna uh, talk about you know. that later. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think at the same time, I think it's very important from a pedagogical perspective, yeah. right? Because one of the things that, hap what happened to critical, you know, to uh, uh, cultural studies? Yes. 
right? They were very, you know, they got dissolved in every single discipline and etc. right? And they really helped to change the world. I think they have helped to change the theoretical world, some of the paradigm, but, you know, I would like to know what they have to say here, right? And I think as anthropologists, because we have done the empirical work, because we've been sitting with the people, not talking about rhizomatic power relation from our comfortable office in the 16e arrondissement in Paris, but actually <laughs> spending our time in the bloody New Guinea in, uh, in uh, West Cameroon, such as Rosalie looking at you know, the work that she has done on mining or with you know, sex workers, with all of that. I think it's a very, it's valid and it's anthropology. It is not critical studies. It is not you know, political studies. It's actually field work and long-term field work. So I'm very inflamed about you know, that, that's the first point, <laughs> right? Thank you. And I think that that's what we need to remind the students, right? Okay, so the first thing. The other thing, <laughs> the, the... <laughs> yeah, one minute, but yeah, no, there is a lot to say here. And I, I, I would like to claim the right to respond to some of the points here. I don't think that silencing is a very important phenomenon, but an anthropology of silencing is dialectically called for an anthropology of free speech. So I don't think that silencing is really the, 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 the would be the right, it, it's a very important phenomenon to examine, but making an anthropology of silencing in itself, I think it would be slightly problematic because a lot of stuff is, is what's happening today is indeed the weaponization of identity.